Our panel consists of Dr. Joseph Borscano, a renowned Lyme specialist who many of you know. His fan club is here, and his bio is included in your program. Dr. Ray is with us tonight. He's a uh, family physician for 22 years and former director of the Department of Family Practitioners at Southampton Hospital. <laughs> and Stacy Sobel, executive director of Turn the Corner Foundation, who will moderate, participate, and keep the conversation going. So let's begin where the documentary left off. Um, thank you for having all of us here tonight. Um, and um, Turn the Corner Foundation is very proud of our contributions to helping patients who are suffering from Lyme and tick-borne diseases. We're a not-for-profit, and we um, raise money for research, education, awareness, and innovative treatments for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. And um, Dr. Bierscano, you wanted to say a couple words about yourself? Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. I can't see any of you because I'm being blinded right now, but that's, that's all right. Um, again, thank you all for coming. It's really a nice, nice to see you all again and a nice turnout. Um, I left practice here in East Hampton in about 2007, I believe, and since then I've been involved in a lot of research. And I find that very satisfying because instead of helping my patients one at a time, I'm now in a position to maybe help a lot of people all at once. Um, you've seen the movie, you've seen the kind of problems that we face both in the medical and the political arena. And the research that we're doing now, and not that I'm doing so much, but I'm helping get the ball rolling, that's going to help to change a lot of things, I think. I'm very optimistic for the future. And Dr. Rea? Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Rea. I was, uh, I was an emergency room physician for eight years in the inner city, and came out here to uh, work at Southampton Hospital Emergency Room for two years. And I've, I've been a family physician for 23 years. And uh, my first ex exposure with chronic Lyme's disease, you know, j just as an aside, was my first work uh, week in the emergency room out here. I had a child come in who hadn't been able to walk properly for about six months. And uh, one day, the, the child's knee blew up like a balloon. And I walked past the room, and I saw this kid crying. And I tried to stand him up, and he couldn't walk. And I went in to look at him. And coming from the inner city in an ER doc for eight years, I thought I knew a lot about medicine. So <clears throat> I went to start to tap the child's knee, and I'm getting the fluid out, and this, uh, the head of the emergency room comes by. He was an old fellow from Montauk, uh, and he, he, he's a great personality. I really love him. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, that's Montauk knee. I said, Montauk knee. And sure enough, I treated the kid with antibiotics, and uh, it came back as Lyme's disease. So I, I've seen a lot of Lyme's disease since I've been out here. I see about three to five cases a week. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have had such a consultant as Joe because I'll go out approximately six months with antibiotics. And I, I treat people from all over the world. I'm on the phone a lot with London and uh, Switzerland. And I had two people I tre treated in Italy on the telephone this year. But I have the fortune of being in, uh, having a closed practice, so I don't see new patients. So I, ma I managed to uh, diagnose Lyme very early. I do not trust the, the laboratory diagnosis. It's wrong 30 to 40% of the time. And I'm not afraid to put people on antibiotics and go out as far as six months. Past six months, if I don't see even an inkling of a person getting better and I'm not denting the problem, then I will get a consultation with Lyme's experts such as Joe. And he's helped me out immensely and he's a real loss to the community. I'm sorry that you left us. Well, that's a good segue into our first question, which is about testing for Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. Um, how is one tested? Is there a reliable test? Is there any new tests? And can you explain anything about the bands that come back in the test results? <laughs> so why don't we start with that very complicated, actually very difficult question. It's always been said, and rightly so, that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. You don't make the diagnosis based on a blood test. Um, there's no blood test right now that's so accurate that a positive means you definitely have it and a negative means you definitely do not. So it's based on clinical information. Now, what does that mean? It means your history. Were you well and then you went camping or you were landscaping and then you start to get sick? Um, was there a bite that you know of? Was there a rash? Do your animals have tick bites? Do your other family members have tick bites? Um, what were the symptoms? How did they change over time? What affected them? This whole historical background is maybe 90% of the diagnosis. Um, 
So as we improve our testing, and we are definitely doing that, it still means that the diagnosis is a clinical one. Now, the testing can be faulty both in the positive and in the negative way. In other words, you could have Lyme disease and not show it. And a commercial test, such as you get from a commercial lab, um, an established case of Lyme disease can be missed at least a third of the time, maybe even half. It depends on the statistics you look up. So if you have a, a test that's no better than a coin toss, <laughs> you know, that, how good is that? But it can go the other way, too. Sometimes if you have an acute virus, such as mononucleosis, you can get a positive on a Lyme test when, in fact, you don't have Lyme. And that's why when patients would come to me and say, you know, I'm exposed a lot. When I have my annual physical, my once a year physical, should I get a Lyme test once a year? The answer is always no, because if it's positive, it may not be a real positive. If it's negative, it doesn't mean anything. So it's more by the symptoms you have. Um, all right, now, that being said, there is a room or value to doing the testing, and that is it adds some information. Um, just like if someone has a cough, you often do an x-ray if you need to for the chest, just that gives you added information. But not everyone with a cough gets a chest x-ray. So when it comes to testing for Lyme, you want to look for um, evidence that you've had the infection. Um, unfortunately, the type of testing we have for Lyme don't indicate the status of the infection, how bad it is, or when you're cured of it. In fact, there is no test for cure. So again, it goes back to a clinical diagnosis. Um, in terms of the tests, there's two broad classes. One are the indirect tests, and that's what everyone gets done at the hospital, at the local Quest lab and LabCorp and all the others. And they measure exposure to the germ only. They're called antibody tests. ELISA test, Western blot tests. And they've shown with maybe 70, 50 to 70% accuracy whether you've been exposed to the germ. Um, unfortunately, and this is a strange paradox, you've seen some of this in the film, the sicker the patient, the less reliable are these tests. Um, and a lot of time, Lyme patients who are very sick and have been sick for a long time and not properly diagnosed will go for a Lyme test. It doesn't show anything. The doctor says, well, we know it's not Lyme because your test was negative. But the paradox is, aside from the fact that the test is not that great to begin with, the sicker the person, the less reliable it is. And then, unfortunately, the patients get labeled as being hysterical or crazy or having some other disease or, God forbid, they get the wrong treatment and make them even sicker. So that's a big problem. A big push in research is now in the other area of testing, what's called the direct test. Um, do you have the germ in your body right now today, rather than the other kind, which shows past exposure? And the two types of direct tests that are being worked on, one is to look for evidence of the germ by finding pieces of its DNA in your blood or the urine or even spinal fluid. Um, that test is about a 30% sensitivity. In other words, out of 10 people, it'll pick up maybe three, unfortunately. But on the other hand, when it is positive, it means you definitely have it. Another type of direct test, which has gotten a lot of publicity lately, is a culture test. Um, what's done is blood is taken and has to be at the right time of day, and it's a lot of technical difficulties to do it properly. But once you get the test done well, it actually looks for the living germ in your bloodstream by growing it in the test tube in little Petri dishes and incubators. And the beauty of that is you can identify not only is it Lyme disease, but the type of Lyme disease. Now, in North America alone, we have at least two, if not 300 different types of Lyme germs. And they all have little differences in terms of how they make you feel and what medications would be the best. And now, with this new testing technology, which is not yet available, will be over the next few months, you will start to be able to answer these questions. And I talked to Stacy from Turn the Corner now, and one of the, the things about this test is not so much for patient diagnosis, but for future research. Because now we can start to answer the question, all right, you have a strange illness. We think it's you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, or maybe you're depressed. Maybe not. Maybe it's Lyme disease. So we need to find out by doing complete studies, looking for patterns of illness that find Lyme in places we never saw them before. Another big question comes up, um, transmission from mother to child. There's been a lot of evidence that that has occurred and can occur. But until you get an accurate direct test, like these DNA tests and cultures, you can't be sure. Another area for research. Um, a big hot topic question, which everyone asks, and I can't give an answer to, is person-to-person -person transmission. If the husband has it, can the wife catch it, and vice versa? Well, nobody knows. How would you do an ethical human experiment? You really can't. Animal studies have shown there is such a thing as direct transmission. With the newer testing, we might be able to answer that as well. I can keep going on, but I think I'll stop there. Okay, well, <laughs> that's um, we'll follow up with Dr. Raya. If you can maybe tell us in your patients that you see, 
what percentage actually do you, do you do you actually find a positive Lyme test? And the other question from the audience is how long should you wait to be treated after removing a tick? So if you could. Well, the first question is uh, I don't use the Lyme test very much. I have to admit it. Most of the times I treat people for Lyme, it's on a clinical diagnosis. If there's a history of a tick bite and the symptoms sound like they could be Lyme's, I'd rather not wait and see someone get sick because the, way, the longer you wait to treat a patient, the harder it is to cure. And preventive medicine is the best. So I treat uh, just tick bites on, on many occasions uh, because I'd rather not see someone get sick. If the tick's been on for greater than 12 to 24 hours, and especially if it's been on overnight because it's given the tick time to feed and then regurgitate the, the spirochete back into the, the patient's bloodstream, I will treat. And my regimen of treating, uh, I like ceftin. I don't know why. Doxycycline tends to make people uh, a little bit ill. It gives their uh, a little bit of stomach cramps. And also you have a little bit of sun toxicity over the summer. So my, my, my preference is ceftin, and I have been treating seven days for tick bites if it's been on 12 to 24 hours. And I have to admit, I've not had a single case of Lyme's disease with preventive treat, treatment of seven days with ceftin. Now there was a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago saying that you could use two uh, tablets of 200 milligrams of doxycycline. I, I haven't tried that, and I'm still waiting to, to see what happens with well, that. That study that showed a single dose of doxycycline is effective was very terribly flawed and heavily criticized, and that recommendation is not followed by Lyme-aware physicians, so don't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the, um, the, the, the Lyme-aware physicians have told us that they recommend um, if you have the tick bite and you're aware of it, um, about 30 days, 21 to 30 days of antibiotic treatment. Um, At a minimum, yeah. I, tr I treat for seven days preventive, yes. preventively, yes. but as far as treating uh, limes, at if a minimum, it, it's 21 to 30 is what, yeah. is what they're suggesting. Right and now. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a doctor and Turn the Corner is not a medical organization, but we hear from people all the time. We, we hear from people all over the world who are suffering. And um, there also uh, seems to be a resistance with the medication, too. When I first came out, they said use penicillin and erythromycin. And we used it, and for a while it worked pretty good. And then we switched to amoxicillin, and then that seemed to work pretty good. And then that wasn't working very well anymore. So, uh, so I throw that in your quarter. Are we seeing more of a resistance to the antibiotics? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, there are several different points. Um, point one is that you don't treat every single tick bite. It has to do with was it the type of tick that can tr transmit an infection? Was it on long enough to be a problem? Um, and that's controversial. Was it removed properly? If you had the tick on only three hours, if you break it open while you take the tick off, you're spilling the germ contents into the wound, and that can make it worse. If you're picking it up with your fingers or tweezers and squeezing the body of the tick, you're squeezing the germs into you. So how long the tick was on is only part of it. How it was removed is another part of it. How risky is it to you as a person? Um, the threshold for treating a pregnant woman in the first trimester is much lower than it would be if you're otherwise a healthy, robust person. So all these different factors come into play. Um, if someone came to my office with a tick bite and said, what should I do? Well, that was not a quick five minute visit. That was actually a half an hour visit because we had to weigh the pros and cons and come up with a meeting of the minds. And it's also the one that gets away. You know, people say, oh, I had a tick bite. And then you go examine them. And you know, on the, on the screen, it looks like these ticks are pretty big things. I've pulled uh, uh, larvae off where they're the size of the tip of the needle, not the head of the needle. They can be tiny. So that's I've, right. It's not the tick that you find and take off. It's the one that you didn't the one see that got that's away. back here somewhere. That's the one that caused the trouble. And of course, the earlier it's treated, the better the chances of a positive, of a, of a good result. That's correct. And so the important thing is to educate the public to the potential of these diseases and so that they are getting treatment earlier rather than getting sicker and sicker over time. Okay, um, a question on a little different tangent. Has there been any attempt to eliminate ticks in the environment? Is there do, are, there, are we doing anything to lower the deer population in the Hamptons? I put up my deer fence and well, I keep four wild uh, cats for my rabbits and mice. Not my car. <laughs> I looked. Actually, you know, this is actually a lot of information a lot of people don't know about. Um, in order to make a dent in the population of ticks, you have to not only get rid of 
deer, you have to get rid of all the deer. Even a little bit of deer make a difference. So that's not going to happen. So you have to look for some alternative. Another way is to try and get rid of the mice or to treat where the mice live. Um, little, you've seen bait boxes and so forth where the mice will run around and get the food and then get brushed with insecticide and kill off. Well, you know what happens? The ticks are not stupid. They go on to something else or they go on a bird. So what they actually found is the most useful um, are devices that target the, all of the different animals with um, tick repellents and tick killers. And the most successful thing that's been used out here actually is what's called a four poster. And it's a deer feeding station where they put dried corn um, into a feeder for the deer. And the deer has to walk up a ramp to get it. And as the deer puts his head into the trough, on either side of paint rollers with the insecticide on it. So it rubs the insecticide on the deer and it really does work. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency came around and said, you can't have this anywhere within wetlands or by schools or by children, which means that you can't have them. So finally, after years and years and maybe even decades, finally Shelter Island got the, the um, environmental people to let them put a few of them up. And the results are still very early, but the results are very, very helpful. In other words, it works, it does work. So this is the kind of thing where we have to balance risk versus benefit, whether it's antibiotic or not, or a lot or a little, or intravenous or oral, or a month versus six months. It's also, do we do something in the environment to get rid of some of it? Well, nobody likes the insecticides, but no one likes to get sick or disabled or die from Lyme disease. So there has to be a reasonable balance. And to just say, we can't have these, these successful and effective deer feeding stations, these four posters, we can't need to have them anywhere in the wetlands, well, that's silly. You know, you have to have some balance here. And I'd like to see, again, at the grassroots level, political level, some more action in this area to not poison the environment or kill every single deer or put fences around the whole entire Long Island, but use things that are known to work and be reasonable in, in where they're implemented. Um, can you talk a little bit about tick, um, I'm sorry, co-infections, the other infections that one tick can carry that in addition to Borrelia burgdorferi? Oh, it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> you know, I think of the tick as nature's dirty needle. Because the whole idea is if you get a tick bite, you get, maybe you can get Lyme disease. Well, what about, can you get other germs, other infections from it? Well, again, think of the tick as nature's dirty needle. The tick is a bug, it lives in the dirt, it lives for up to two years, and during its two year lifespan, it has the ability to bite and actually suck the blood out of birds, raccoons, dogs, cats, people, moles, voles, mice, I mean, the list goes on and on. So to think that this tick picked up one germ is ridiculous. Put it another way, if you took a needle and stuck it into all these moles and voles and ticks and whatever, and then put it into you, do you think you'd get one germ, one infection? Of course not. So what's been found is that people who've had diagnosis of Lyme disease got some medications for Lyme disease, and some things changed, but you know what, they weren't well. They didn't get over it. Then they found, lo and behold, they didn't have only Lyme disease, which is a spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi, they had another thing, such as babesiosis, which is not a bacteria at all, it's a parasite like malaria. And then so they would get treatment then for that. And they get a little bit better, but they were still a bit sick. Well, they have another germ, anaplasma. Then they treat that. Oh, there's another thing. It's Ehrlichia. Oh, there's Bartonella. And there's tick-borne encephalitis. <laughs> We've even found West Nile in ticks. Um, we shared a case a number of years ago with that. Um, so the whole issue is co-infections. Now, if you look in the medical literature where the doctors go to medical school and they read the textbooks, almost nothing is written about that. This is why you need to see, in some cases, a Lyme literate physician, people out here who've, physicians out here who've gotten the experience, that Lyme is an illness that is not just one germ, it's potentially a mixture of different germs. And studies have been done, again, funded by Turn the Corner, where they collected ticks in different areas and found one tick can have all these different germs. Um, and you know, the sad part is, and the disturbing thing is, when you have a, a, what we call a co-infection with a mixture of the germs, the symptoms get more vague and gets more difficult to diagnose. And one of my patients was great. She said, it's like when you mix two colors together, you get a third color. You get a little bit different symptoms. So things don't always look the same way. And maybe you won't even be diagnosed as Lyme at all. You'd be given some other diagnosis completely wrong or different. Um, another parallel to what I said earlier about the sicker you are, the less accurate the tests are. When you're co-infected, that also makes the tests less accurate but also makes you more ill and more drug resistant. So the co-infection issue is a huge one. And if you look into what the government is doing in terms of research, there's almost no research being done on co-infections. And that's a very big mistake, and hopefully pressure from Turn the Corner and other groups um, and the legislation that they're pushing will help. But right now, that's a big vacuum. And the focus here tonight, we're speaking a lot about Lyme's, but Babesia 
is a, it's a lethal disease. It's probably 30% of the population who get Babesia die. And if you don't have a spleen, it's closer to 100%. Mm. It's a very nasty uh, 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 tick-borne disease. And it, most of the time, 100% uh, of the time that I've seen Babesia, it had limes with it. Yeah. And in one case, it had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And then you start running into trouble with the insurance companies because you know, they open up their book and it's a cookbook and it says, well, Lyme's disease, you do this. And you can't do this. You have to use different drugs that aren't in the books. And that's when all of a sudden you get the call, oh, we're not paying for that drug. And I do IV uh, Rosefin out of my office and the insurance companies, oh, we don't pay for IV. And well, why not? This is a disease that it can kill. And uh, that's where we run into trouble with the the insurance companies, and every day there's a new antibiotic on their lists that seem they don't pay for it anymore. And it's like you try and substitute, but there aren't any substitutes for a lot of these drugs that the insurance companies deny. You see, that's why Lyme is what I call a political disease at this point. And you know, the punchline of the movie is not how badly these people had felt, but you saw all the corruption. I mean, I went to the Senate in 1993, and I testified before the Senate about this, um, and nothing's changed. The same people who are the ones who advise insurance companies how to limit their, their payments to sick patients are the ones who write the textbooks. So the insurance company reads the textbooks and say, oh, this is great. Well, they're paying these people to write this. Um, and until that changes, and that's not gonna change on its own, that requires legislative change. Until that changes, nothing's gonna get better. Um, it's an one, adjunctive treatment. Yeah, one last question is about um, chronic Lyme or post-Lyme syndrome. There's controversy about what we call it. Um, does it exist? Do you want to just address that? A number of people who get Lyme disease go through treatment, and after treatment ends, they don't come back to normal, or they're improved but not where they should be. So what does that mean? Do they still have the infection? Or is there some permanent damage? Or did the infection trigger off something else, a new syndrome that they never had before? Can Lyme disease cause fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome? Um, nobody stupid. really can say that for sure, and because of that, there's controversy. Some say there's no such thing as chronic Lyme, you've had a month of treatment and you're, you're cured and that's it. Others say, wait, we've had a patient, we've had a month of treatment, and they're still sick and we can still find the germ, we give more medicine, they get better. But again, as you said before, everyone is different. But the problem has always been because we don't have a blood test that can tell you when you're cured, okay? So if you get treatment and you improve to a point but not completely, that becomes the difficult part. And that's where the physician and the patient have to call, form what I call a therapeutic alliance, where the patient keeps careful diaries, the doctor goes through the diaries carefully, there's a lot of discussion, several visits, not just one quick visit, this is it to try and divine out what's really going on, because an ongoing infection of any kind, including Lyme, leaves certain markers behind, certain physical findings, certain temperature patterns by taking diaries, you can see this. And by looking at these clinical features, an experienced physician can say whether they think you're still infected or not. So part number one is to try and decide what this post-treatment syndrome is. Is it still an infection or not? In some people it's an infection, in some people it isn't. Or maybe it's a co-infection. Maybe you've had treatment for Lyme disease, but you're left with some Babesia. Now, there are at least 13 different types of Babesia that ticks can give to humans and make them sick. We only have a test for two of them. You know, so if you don't have, you know, you have a test for number one and for number two, but you have type number seven, and the doctor says, well, we don't know what's wrong with you, you know. So maybe the post-Lyme, post-treatment Lyme symptoms have to do with some other infection you got. A chronic Lyme infection weakens your immune system. And we've seen patients who've gone through Lyme and they develop, for example, a herpes infection gets reactivated or they get shingles again because the immune system went down and they picked up something new. So this post-treatment Lyme is a very vague area because we don't have a good test. All right, now let's say you found a good Lyme doctor, you went through your diary, did all this good stuff, and you think there's still an infection there. Now what do you do? Which is the best drug? Every one is different. Um, what works for you is not gonna work for you. So then you go through a trial and error period. You take this medicine, it could be expensive, it could be upsetting your stomach, it could be a risk for your liver, but you do it for a month or maybe even six weeks and you stop and sit back, oh, did it help or not? Well, if it didn't help, does that mean you don't have Lyme and you, maybe you just have something you're stuck with? Or does it mean that wasn't the right drug? Do you go to another drug or a different type of a treatment? Or then you say, forget the antibiotics, I wanna go into hyperbaric chambers or take some herbs or something. Or did you get bit again? Or and, did, and, yeah, did you get bit and, again? And, so this and, is uh, where the uncertainty comes. You're drug comes. resistant. And 
again, the best way to handle this is for you all to be empowered, to learn as much about it, to talk to others who've been in that, that situation, and learn as much as you can to help the doctor and help yourselves. That's the most important thing. And the one thing I also want to add, very often chronically sick patients, Lyme or otherwise, but especially Lyme, um, they get so consumed by their illness that they alienate their friends and family. And very often, sadly, the family members say, oh, that's just you know, crazy Johnny or crazy Mary, and just, you know, they don't take them seriously anymore. And that's so sad. Um, Lyme is tragic. You've heard of the divorces that, from this one film. You, two main characters, both of them got divorced. Um, so part of this self-help and self-awareness also involves a whole family and friends. Very important. Thank you. We thank the... the Hamptons Take Two Film Festival for um, being brave and showing this movie. Yes. <laughs>